Welcome back to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. This was supposed to be Infrastructure Week. Instead, the Trump administration had to compete with chaos, mixed messages, and infighting. The culprit? Often the president, who took to Twitter less to advance his agenda than to engage in dead-end fights and contradict his administration's policies at home and abroad. We're under siege. We will come out bigger and better and stronger than ever. It all started Monday with a storm of tweets in the wake of the London terror attacks. In 140 character bursts, President Trump criticized London's Muslim mayor and shamed his own Justice Department for having watered down his order halting immigration from countries with terrorist links and for not calling it a travel ban. On Tuesday, President Trump sided with the nine Arab countries punishing Qatar, claiming it backs terrorists, saying the move showed his diplomacy with those countries was paying off. The problem? His Pentagon had just voiced support for Qatar, where America has its largest military base in the Middle East, and where his Secretary of State says the Arab blockade of Qatar is hurting the fight against ISIS. Wednesday, administration aides were battling back stories of strife. The New York Times reported Attorney General Jeff Sessions had offered to resign. President Trump was reportedly unhappy Sessions had recused himself from the Russia investigation. For two days, White House spokespeople could not confirm that the president had faith in his attorney general. And Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats was trying to answer for a Washington Post report saying the president had asked him to get then-FBI director James Comey to back off his investigation. I don't believe it's appropriate for me to uh, address that uh, in a public session. Thursday, Comey himself testified to pressure he felt from the president in nine one-on-one -on -one conversations and the reason he thought he was fired. It's my judgment that I was fired because of the Russia investigation. He also defended his actions as head of the FBI. The administration then chose to defame me and, more importantly, the FBI by saying that the organization was in disarray, that it was poorly led, that the workforce had lost confidence in its leader. Those were lies, plain and simple. Compelling, but the president so had powerful defenders like House Speaker Paul Ryan. The president's new at this. He's new to government, and so he probably wasn't steeped in the long-running protocols. Friday, during a joint news conference, President Trump claimed vindication. No collusion, no obstruction. He's a leaker. On Friday afternoon, President Trump escaped the White House heat and headed for his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. To discuss all that and more, <laughs> we're joined by USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page, Washington Post columnist David Ignatius, Associated Press White House correspondent Julie Pace, and CBS News contributor and Washington Post congressional reporter Ed O'Keefe. Julie, I want to start with you. There's a lot going on. Where, where are things at the end of James Comey's testimony and the president's response in this story? Well, I think we're at a point right now where Comey's testimony did up open up new lines of inquiry for the congressional investigators. Certainly, I think it points toward Mueller looking at obstruction of justice as this investigation expands. From the perspective of the White House, they do have some things from the testimony to latch on to. Certainly, the fact that Comey came out and said, yes, I did tell the president three times that he was not personally under investigation. You are going to hear that over and over and over again from this White House. I think, though, that the White House is coming to grips with the fact that even though Comey's testimony is behind them, this is a cloud that is going to hang over this White House for a long time. This is not going away. And when I say that, I mean that staffers in the White House have, uh, have a grasp of that. I'm not quite sure the president fully understands that this is something that is going to be part of his presidency for a very long time. That's right, David. So this question of whether the president is being investigated, as Julie said, they really uh, held on to that. But that was when James Comey was FBI director that he said that. So. Where do you think things stand now in terms of the president being investigated and what he has to worry about? Well, I, we don't know, and I think that's the point, is this now is in the hands of Robert Mueller, very experienced, very tough prosecutor, and he will explore these leads. Uh, I thought, as, as Julie said, that um, this was not a decisive uh, moment in this, in this story. Uh, Lindsey Graham 
earlier said it was a wrestling match. Uh, it, it was, certainly was a match in which there was no knockout punch. Uh, each side had its, its, its strong points. The picture of, of President Trump that was presented by James Comey, uh, even uh, Senator Lankford said, was very inappropriate behavior. Uh, the kind of behavior, it's, it's just hard to imagine a president saying those things to his FBI director about ongoing investigations, but not a, not a knockout punch. Uh, I, I think uh, everybody needs to hunker down now for a long process. Just a final uh, takeaway. Watching the reactions from Republicans in the Senate, I think it's going to be very hard to pursue this ob obstruction of justice theme as long as there's a Republican Congress. So next year's uh, midterm elections, I think, in some ways, are going to be a referendum on what we heard this week. That's right, Susan. David um, makes the right point, which is this is a political court. This isn't about whether the president can be prosecuted in a court of law. And so those initial reactions, while uh, people might not have joined in in the White House's uh, complaints about James Comey, there was nobody saying, well, either, you know, the president's really in trouble. And so isn't that the best news for him of all, that Republicans aren't, uh, you know, talking about impeachment or, or still seem to be behind him? I, I, I guess I wouldn't uh, see it in that sunny in that sunny way because while of course it's true that this week did not settle what's going to happen in this investigation, what it did make clear was there are multiple strands of investigations, not just Russian collusion but obstruction of justice, that it touches the president, the president's son-in-law, his top aides, his attorney general, uh, that these investigations are going to continue, be a cloud, sap his ability to get other things done, and that while Republicans didn't break with him. Remember, we're, it was just last month that, that uh, Comey was fired as FBI director. This investigation and this controversy is moving very, very quickly. You compare it to Watergate. Uh, I mean, think about the months and months and months that proceeded with Watergate before you got even near the point we are now where the president says, 100 percent, I'll testify under oath. That is extraordinary. I think that Donald Trump has been so unprecedented in so many ways. Uh, in office and as a candidate, that it, we risk losing sight how historic this procession of events is going to be and how much it is likely to define his presidency. And Ed, uh, as Susan points out, there's, um, you know, and, and Senator Langford said the president's uh, obstruction question is still uh, being investigated by the Senate committee. Uh, in testimony, James Comey said that he was sure that that's what uh, the special counsel would be investigating. So while the president is focusing on Comey telling him he's not being investigated. He seems to be uh, facing a lot of this now. What's the reaction up on the Hill uh, that was not being said publicly? I think there's just this understanding, as, as Lindsey Graham so uh, presciently described it, that he's, he's just self-inflicting himself with these wounds. And the more he stays quiet and just allows the legal process and the committee process to play out at this point, the better for him and, and the more focused the White House can remain on the policy that Congress is trying to enact. It's important to remind folks at home, despite what you might see on TV and read in the papers, there was big work this week on rolling back financial regulatory reforms of the Obama era. Uh, Republicans are struggling to come up with a health care plan and may not be able to do it. Uh, and, and as Senator Graham alluded to, there is uh, significant bipartisan work underway right now to get a sanctions bill passed that not only punishes Russia, but also Iran. Originally, it was just going to punish Iran, and the Democrats and some Republicans insisted on adding Russia. And the Senate now realizes they've got a real chance here for some significant bipartisan work. But all that gets clouded by what will happen Tuesday when the Attorney General testifies to the Intelligence Committee. And I think equally dramatically, his deputy goes and talks to uh, appropriations subcommittee to explain himself as well. Every week, there's probably going to be something like this, some public forum where it gets raised again and attention is, is put on it. Committee rooms and closed door meetings will be the centers of the drama on the Hill in the next few weeks. His deputy, Rod Rosenstein. Right. Susan, let me ask you a question on the Rosenstein question here, because James Comey testified. One of the most striking lines from him was that he said that the administration line that the FBI was that morale was bad and that and that he had somehow been a bad leader, he said, was it just an absolute lie. Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, in his letter to the president explaining why Comey uh, had not done his job well, 
talked about those things. He said the credibility of the FBI had suffered damage, that uh, the public trust about the FBI had suffered damage. So James Comey, when he said there was lying, wasn't just talking about the president. He was talking about the deputy attorney general. That's right. Although it's certainly clear that there were a lot of questions raised about uh, Comey's behavior as, as FBI director. It, he doesn't come to this with uh, a reputation that is unsullied, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to his handling of the Hillary Clinton investigation and his public comments about that. That said, his standing within the FBI, with FBI uh, staffers, with the agents with whom he works, seems to have been very strong. So this may be a case where Rod Rosenstein is, is correct in saying there was some erosion of public confidence in the FBI by Democrats. And also, when Comey says that it is a, I think he said a lie, pure and simple, uh, that, his, that, he, that he was leading an agency that somehow been crippled yeah. because of his leadership. Uh, another challenge for James Comey, David, is the fact that he leaked his own memos uh, through a friend to the papers. Uh, have we seen a bank shot like that before? And what do you make of a bank shot like that? It's, uh... well, it shows you that, that James Comey pl plays hardball. Yeah. Uh, his decision after he had been fired to, to, to take this information and use uh, what intelligence is known as a cutout, uh, give it to a lawyer, we'll give it to the, to the press, uh, shows that he, he was going to put pressure, turn the screws, for the appointment of a special counsel, and he, and he got what he wanted. Um, I don't think there's anything illegal in, in what he did, but, but I, I think it, it undermined his credibility. If he's going to be a witness in this he said, he said drama going forward, it probably, probably hurt, hurt him a little bit. Um, everybody's playing hardball now. Mm -hmm. the, the, the president is. The president has hired one of the toughest, you know, <laughs> roughest, toughest lawyers around to argue his case in uh, Mark Krasowitz. So we're, we're going to, to the memo to the country, hunker down. Yeah. This is just beginning, and it's it's going to be a tough fight. But you know, not, not illegal to leak it. In fact, not unusual. And in fact, when Absolutely. I read that remarkable story in the New York Times, I thought, oh, Comey gave somebody his memo to leak. In fact, yeah. I thought possibly Comey leaked it himself as uh, somebody close to Comey. That is something I suspect all of us at this table have done. At one and I point. think important for, for readers and viewers to draw a distinction between leaks of classified information, which is something that the administration has been hammering, which is illegal, and political leaks, essentially, which is what Washington really thrives on. I mean, what Comey did was pull back the curtain on something that is a fairly regular process in this town. It's not It's not clean, it doesn't look pretty, but it's what happens day but to day. But that process is what Donald Trump has been running against. Mm -hmm. a and he has a lot of people out there who yeah. share his view that there's something wrong with it. Uh, you know, we journalists don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's part of how information but there are a lot of people in the country who, who don't like it. And but so no I clean think, hands at the White House on leaking either. <laughs> uh, I, I understood. I'm just saying, again, we're heading yeah. into, into a messy uh, uh, season in, in which the charges are going to go back and forth. And there are so many people in the country who look at Washington, Washington we're describing, and don't like it. That's right. And this is a battle for public opinion. And so because if anything's going to happen to the president, it's going to have to happen in Congress. So people who don't like it, even if it doesn't fit the te technical definition of something to be prosecuted, they don't like, it seems unseemly. Yeah, and I just, I thought it was fascinating how quickly everyone uh, in Trump's orbit seized on the idea that he's a leaker. There is nothing yeah. inherently illegal about somebody sharing information with a reporter or leaking it unless it's classified. And it looks like there may be an FBI policy that he violated by taking his work product home and then sharing it with a reporter. But regardless, it wasn't classified information. This is how Washington works, at least the old way. And I thought that was one of the most brilliant moments of the whole thing because it was really tra transparently describing to people at home, uh, literally, this is how this works. You, know, you see it in the paper. This is what I did to make that happen. And I think the other important thing here is he put into the public record now months of reports about how the president behaves as a boss. You wrote about this uh, for The Atlantic, that this was an HR document, essentially, and he was <laughs> confirming a lot of what we heard about the way the president works and the idea that people are fearful of confronting him in the moment about this stuff, that for whatever reason he's intimidating or he, you know, somehow exudes something that stops people from telling him, sir, that's not a good idea. Can, we're going to take just a break here. Susan, I'll tee you up when we come back on the other side. Everybody sit tight. We'll be right back.
And we're back with more from our politics panel. Susan, uh, you were going to say something before we left. You know, I was going to say one of the big disclosures in the Comey testimony was that he, in fact, leaked, if in effect, leaked this document to the New York Times. And it struck me that this is exactly what happens when you have an investigation, and especially when you have people testifying under oath. Senator Collins asked him the question that got the answer, not even realizing, to her surprise, that he would turn out to be the leaker. And it's turned out to be perhaps the most damaging thing, single thing on for his part yeah. that he said during that, this hearing. This would show the risk, for instance, of Donald Trump's 100% guarantee that he is willing to testify under oath about this whole affair. Julie, you think he's going to testify to the president? I think if the president's lawyers have anything to say about <laughs> it, then he then he might not. But, uh, you know, the president is someone who kind of throws these things out there on the table, and then we watch his staff and presumably his lawyers in this case start to walk it back. Well, and we're going to step back and look at all, all the other things that happened uh, this week. But, Ed, do you think, you know, everybody on the Hill wants him to testify. Um, I don't think that's going to happen to you. Uh, not, not to the Senate, I don't think. I think more likely he ends up talking to Robert Mueller. I can't imagine a, a forum in which he would come and talk to the Senate as Senator Schumer offered. I'm, it's nice of him to ask, but I don't think that's the way it would happen. Before we move on to the rest of the world, um, David, uh, Attorney General Lynch from the Obama administration, also not some good news for her out of the out of the Comey testimony, um, this idea that basically she told Comey to refer to the investigation in Hillary Clinton as a matter as opposed to an investigation. Yes, she seemed to be, t to be trying to trim this uh, for the uh, political benefit of, of, uh, of Secretary Clinton, and, and I think that, that harmed her, her reputation. Um, and Comey was very firm in saying this was a criminal investigation. It wasn't a matter. Uh, he, he, he pushed back pretty hard on that. So I think she, she will be called, as Senator Graham said, and that will be a, you know, she'll, she'll get grilled. Sessions will be appearing next week, Susan. What do you think of the Attorney General? What do you think about his, what, what does next week hold for him? And Senator Langford told, said uh, in the interview that you just did that it's, it's his assumption that will be in public. We all hope that'll be the case because there is nothing more interesting than watching these, 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 these hearings. It's, imp it's important because for one thing we have the question about what was it that prompted James Comey, while he was FBI director, to conclude well before the fact that Sessions was going to have to recuse himself from the Russian investigation. We have some source stories on that, but it would be interesting to hear what's going on. And also the question about why, after recusing himself, he felt free to participate in the firing of James Comey as FBI, FBI director. Those are both big questions. David, I want to ask you a question about this international um, dust-up here. You've got the president um, praising the Arab nations that have uh, cut ties with Qatar. And his Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense uh, uh, backing up Qatar because that's where the U.S. has a military base. How do we sort through all that? I think this is a real uh, disagreement about, about policy. I think the Secretary of State Tillerson, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis, are both concerned about the status of the biggest U.S. base in the Gulf, Al Udaid Air Base, in Qatar. They think it's crucial for the fight against ISIS, and they want to see a mediated s settlement of this dispute between Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, principally other other Gulf states. The president doesn't look at it that way, and uh, he, he thinks this is an opportunity to push back against extremism that uh, Qatar arguably supports. Qatar's closer to Iran than most of the Gulf states. And, and interestingly, I, I'm told the president is backed by H.R. McMaster, his national security advisor, and probably also by Mike Pompeo, his CIA director. So there's a real difference of opinion. Uh, this morning, Tillerson uh, spoke, I'm told, with the deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia. The foreign minister of the UAE is coming to see Tillerson on Wednesday. So this is really rolling, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we're seeing a real di disagreement. And, and Julie, the, this disagreement, um, you mentioned the president kind of throws things out there. This came at, it kind of in that fashion. He also t said that his Department of Justice was pushing a watered-down travel ban, an expression they had, were trying not to use because it had hurt him legally. Uh, he also picked a fight with the London mayor after the terrorist attacks there. These are these are not, these don't seem to be in his interest. These actions, all of them. They, they don't, and it, I mean, it goes to show that even within the administration, no one is safe. President, the president is willing to call out his own uh, Justice Department. He's willing to publicly disagree with his Secretary of State. This this dispute on Qatar happened very publicly. Secretary Tillerson was sitting in the front row of the news conference where the president got up and essentially said, "I'm siding with the Saudis on this. I think this is a good thing that's happening here." But again. We have to get over this idea that the president is taking advice, I think, from people in his administration. He is his own man when he believes in an, in an issue, whether it's going to politically backfire on him or not. If he believes that he's going to go out there often on Twitter.
What do you think Ed's going to happen with health care in the Senate? Uh, they're going to keep talking this week. They're going to, the, the goal is to get something done by the August recess, and there is talk of possibly keeping Congress around a little longer in order to, uh, to get it done. They need to get this out of the way because tax reform is, is really the one that they really want to get done at this point. Um, I think what they've realized is it's just too difficult to get 52 people uh, with yeah. all of their ideological and geographic differences to agree on something. What do you think? I'm not happens? counting against uh, Mitch McConnell. And you know who, this this whole furor about Russia and the hearings we had this week, a big gift to Mitch McConnell yeah. because it enabled him to make progress uh, and legislatively on the health care issue without anybody noticing because we were all paying in such, he, he, he invoked Senate rule number 14, which is every Kansas school girl knows, yeah. is the <laughs> rule that enables you to bypass committee hearings so he can just bring this to the floor and have the kind of vote without uh, without the kind of full debate that yeah. you would expect. But it will be far less ambitious than the House bill. Remember that. David, we can't go without you helping us out. What's happening in Great Britain right now? Well, the, what's happening is part of the political reordering that's taking place all, all over the world. I mean, in simple terms, uh, it, it, it turns out that Theresa May is a worse campaigner than we knew. <laughs> it turns out that Jeremy Corbyn, the Labor uh, candidate, is a, is a better campaigner. And I'm hearing from some of my British contacts, maybe, maybe in this vote, there was a little bit of anti-Brexit sentiment, people thinking, you know, this is a way to say, we're not so happy about leaving Europe. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you. We'll be right back. Stay with us. How we behave when no one is watching is a test of character. Under pressure, do you do the right thing? That question was at the center of James Comey's testimony this week, a Washington morality tale with an Oval Office encounter. A high-pressure stage. The president once told us the story of a titan of business who was so awed by the Oval Office, he broke down. James Comey said he felt pressured in the Oval Office to end his investigation into Michael Flynn. The president said he made no such request. There are many disputed points. We don't know who is telling the truth because no one was watching. This highlights something essential about Washington, though. Sooner or later, for people in power, it comes back to those tough, solitary tests. The founders knew men would fail and designed a system to guard against it. The Senate Intelligence Committee was engaged in that protective service, making sure that when power and ambition are mixed, it doesn't lead to an abuse of power. We've seen it in presidents and FBI directors. There are people in Washington who will face these tests or who are mulling ones they've just taken. And the question is, how strong are the standards you bring with you to the room where it happens? Do you keep your faith with the voters, to your oath, to your institution, to the lessons your mother taught you? Standards are what you bring to the character test. Those who keep them are admired, trusted, and forgiven when they falter. But also in Washington, while it sometimes might seem that no one is watching, the hearing this week reminds that eventually everyone might be. We'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. For Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.